Ryan Jeffers homered in the first inning, but that was the extent of the damage from the Twins in a 5-1 loss to the Yankees. It was an old-school pitching matchup, and if you don't know what I mean, just hang on. I'll explain it. This is Locked on Twins. You are Locked on Twins, your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello again and welcome back to Locked On Twins. I'm your host, Brandon Warren, and you can unfollow me on Twitter at Brandon underscore W-A-R-N-E. And joining me as he does is Mr. Dave Brown at Answer Dave Brown on the tweets. What's up? Yankees. Twins got to try and get even with them today. I think there's a good chance that they do that. I screwed up and I muted you again. So you said Yankees and then that was kind of that. Um, sorry. Uh, once again, Dave, what's up? Yankees. <laughs> yeah, the Yankees are up. They are up 1-0 in the series and it's uh, – it's Good day. Good day for the Twins to get even. I think there's a good chance they do that. Yeah, it's going to be uh, Pablo Day against Marcus Stroman. As noted on the postcast last night, Stroman has – struggled with base runners and walks and so we'll see what happens there but thanks for making locked on twins your first listen every day we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts as well as on youtube and as part of the locked on podcast network we're your team every day and again we love to hear from you in the comments thumbs up likes all that fun stuff hit subscribe five star reviews on itunes are huge and i'm going to do something dave uh if people dm me proof of a five star review I will mail you, not Dave, but whoever does it, a Minnesota Twins baseball card and a, and a cool one, not just, you know, some common from a 1987 pack of uh, Fleer, you know, nothing like that. I don't even know if the Fleer existed back then, but in 1987, if, those are good cards, actually. That's a that's a very Bonds rookie season, but whatever. Right? There you go. I, I will send you a baseball card, a Twins baseball card, if you show proof of a five star review, because I'm just cool like that. Anyway, today's episode brought to you by eBay Motors from brakes to exhaust kits and beyond. eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home the big W. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. By the way, make sure you check out the twins on SiriusXM, downloading the SiriusXM app or the SXM app and search twins, you'll have Chris and Paul Molitor. Molitor has been just tremendous. I listened to the game for the first three innings last night, and I I, I think he does a delightful job. But again, Pablo Day against Stroman on Wednesday, first pitch, 640 at Target Field. And then they'll wrap the series in the finale with Joe Ryan and Clark Schmidt. Then the twins are off to Cleveland and Washington. Twins fall 5-1 in the opener, Dave. It's the first time the twins have lost a series opening game in nearly a month since April 19th against Detroit. And I feel like, yeah, some of the losses that they've been taking have been like middle of the series, the bullpen kind of sags and things just go sideways on them. But that's kind of an impressive stat, even if it's not all that predictive or indicative of anything going on. Oh yeah. I don't know if it, if it is indicative or, uh, you know, predictive, you know, maybe not because you never know with pitching matchups and so forth, but uh, I think it shows, you know, good concentration. The Twins ready to go when they start a new series, trying to win that series. I think that's a pretty good mental philosophy to have during a season. Uh, you know, the, the Orioles uh, have not been swept in, you know, nobody knows how long. It's, uh, <clears throat> that's one of the neater stats. And I think it's in, a little bit indicative of how they're, they're playing. So uh, it's relevant. You know, they, um, but there were, you know, there were a couple of, moments in that game that were uh, not fun and kind of uh, rare and not uh, something that we usually see. You know, Willie Castro made a boo-boo in center field, and it wasn't like him at all to do that. And that kind of set them up for the Yankees up for a lead. And, um, you know, he made a maybe a kind of a circular route to a ball in center field later in the game. And, you know, I mean, these things are going to happen. The uh, Carlos Rodon maybe isn't the dominant pitcher that he was a couple years ago, but he's good at getting out of trouble. And the Twins hit a lot of balls hard yesterday. I think they averaged 97-something on 
exit velocity. So they, they were hitting the ball hard. They just weren't getting anything to show for it. And they needed a little bit more with Scott, uh, <laughs> with Chris Paddock not having his best game of the season. Yeah, I thought you might go that route. Yeah, I call it an old-fashioned pitching matchup, not because it was a pitcher's duel, but because the only two pitches above or at 90 miles, 97 miles per hour were thrown by Ian Hamilton. Otherwise, the starters kept it in that kind of middle of the 90s and lower range, which again goes to show how the game is played right now. Big difference in the game, Twins over, uh, over uh, 6, I believe it was, with runners in scoring position. It might have been over 4. I, I'm trying to remember. I don't I, I had it pulled up and then I switched views, but uh, Yankees four for 12 in a game where the Yankees had 13 hits. Uh, the, you know, the only way you're going to keep up is if you make and take advantage of the minimal opportunities that you get. Twins didn't do that. And we're talking about a loss instead of a win. What did you think of Hamilton uh, getting the best of Miranda in a battle of uh, a very theatrical uh, matchup there? I think he now lives in Miranda's head rent free. <laughs> I had that one ready, didn't I? Sensible chuckle. You're over here like Jesus Christ, superstar. Um, do you want to know what a slash line looks like when you give up 13 hits in a game? Yeah. I so I tested. I, I don't think single line single game slash lines mean anything even in the series i kind of feel dumb talking about it it's just but again you have stats that are predictive you have stats that tell you things that happened and i'm not trying to manipulate anything but if a team gets 13 hits in a game what do you suspect their batting average for the game is roughly speaking um 350 351 oh so wow you if we were doing prices right rules you would probably be the winner that's my best math ever. Wow. Yeah, 351, 390, 486. So we're talking like May, sometime in May last year, Luis Arise slash line. Um, but again, yeah, Chris, Chris, not Scott, Scott Paddock, had to kind of dance out of danger, still gave up five runs. Uh, I was impressed by the befores out of the bullpen, which I noted on the postcast too. Um, twins get four scoreless innings from Jackson, Okert, and... Um, uh, who am I missing here? Okert again? No, no it, was, uh, it was Jackson, Okert, and Stalmont. Um, oh, right, Stalmont. That I think that was Stalmont's best. It, yeah, I, I saw. I honestly, I only really remember one slider, but it was a doozy, and it was the Josh Stalmont slider that he really needs, especially if he's not. You know, who knows when if his velocity is going to come back to where it was before? But if he can get that slider over that he threw to that one batter whose name I don't remember, he's going to be able to get some guys out. So I thought that was a great sign. And, you know, you you can't win every game, but you look at little victories like that and getting through um, those guys in the bullpen that you mentioned, the befores, as you call them lovingly, yep. I think that's pretty clever. Um, I, I liked how, you know, who knows what happens with a lineup, but, you know, where, where the Yankees not concentrating as much because they were up and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't high leverage, but yeah. it's anytime you can get through clean innings with uh, with relief pitchers that have been struggling, consider it a victory. Especially if you're going to need to keep a lead, hopefully with Pablo going today, you will be pretty much fresh between Monday's day off and Tuesday's essential day off for most of those guys as well. Yeah, we got a lot of stuff to get to. Uh, Carlos Rodon, you know, I have some. Some stuff about him. We've got some fun stuff down on the farm. It's Zebby Day for Wichita, who is facing Tulsa, in fact, as we speak. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the Yankee mystique, um, the late Twins offense. And I don't mean that it's dead. I just mean that they hit well late in games. And uh, a bunch of other things. Uh, Glenn Perkins had an interesting saying that he said late in the game that I want to kind of dig into and also uh, Ryan Jeffers' note, as he was the opening act, the headliner, and the after party for the Twins offense on Tuesday night. But let's uh, let's do this. Let's take a word or a minute for a word from eBay Motors, and then when we come back, we'll hit on all of those things before we get you out of here and ready for Game Two against those doggone Yankees. 
And our friends at eBay Motors want to make sure that you know that passion, drive, and patience are the formula for winning championships, but also what keep your ride alive and on the road. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Whether you're looking for a supercharger, roof rack, exhaust kit, LED headlights, or much, much more, 122 million parts worth, that is. Uh, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. And you'll always find what you're looking for because of how many parts they have for your number one ride. So with eBay's guaranteed fit, by the way, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, Dave, we are down to the bullpen, our second segment here. And the the Twins, I think, exercised some of their Yankees-related demons by winning the season series last year. Yeah. And as someone who has watched from a distance, I'm sure you've kind of gotten the general vibe. But do you still feel like that cloud exists or is it not? Um, you know, part of it was that it's in the postseason, the Twins. Yeah exercise those demons against a different AL East team in the Blue Jays. Um, but, you know, how, how much longer do you think Twins fans need to feel like, oh, man, we're still kind of the little brother in this scenario? Well, I don't think they need to feel that way at all. But there, there's a, like a need and there's like a need, man. And the Twins fans kind of still have that need to act like that. So uh, and I'm not saying all of them, but the loud ones, um, you know, once let's say the twins face the Yankees in the playoffs. Uh, then we'll, it will be, we can't help it. It'll be relevant. It'll be part of the discourse. It'll be part of the narrative. The players will hate answering questions about it. There's a, a, a yin and a yang. There's a, a it, it has something to do with something, but there's also this idea that, the twins of today are responsible for all these sins of, and uh, yeah. and deficiencies of the past. And I think we know that's not true. And I think it's something that they don't really think about much either, the players. Now, last year, I think it was important for the twins to, to win the season series against the Yankees. I think that was part of – that's one of the best things that happened last year for the twins, especially before the playoffs started. So I think it is there to a certain extent, but it's not anything to dwell on. Uh, one thing though, when you are facing the Yankees, you're usually facing one of the better teams in the league. Mm -hmm. So it's important to uh, look good against them, to play your best, to win two out of three, just in general. That isn't really necessarily a Yankees thing, but that is just a thing that, uh, you know, whatever it takes to motivate yourself, you know, hey, we're a flyover state. We're going to beat these guys from the East Coast. Guys, maybe get them, a few guys get themselves charged up that way by thinking that way. And that's fine. But I don't think it's anything that is overwhelming or shrouding or enveloping or anything like that. It's a, it's a small factor. And it's not hard to see the way the twins lost the opener. Uh, you've got Volpe factoring in Stanton, judge Verdugo, Soto, Rizzo, like all the guys you would expect to beat you if the Yankees beat you contributed in some form or fashion so not exactly as though they got beat down but the yankees did what the yankees do they're, they're a good team they're 15 and 9 away from yankee stadium they have more wins 15 on the road than they do at yankee stadium 13 so they're not coming in feeling like an underdog whatsoever well they're, they're coming off you know think about the it's a it takes two to make a game and the, the yankees are coming off a really disappointing kind of infuriating type season and the Juan Soto acquisition gave them uh, not only a great hitter in the middle of the lineup or the beginning of it, but uh, some life too, and some swagger and uh, judge is playing better. There's a lot of talent on the team. There's a lot of expectations. I mean, you want to talk about baggage. The Yankees just kind of bring their own baggage and they are fighting against themselves and the uh, history of the best team in the history of the league kind of thing all the time. They have to measure up against that. Imagine that. Um, I mean, maybe it would be fun, but it's a different kind of pressure. It's still pressure nonetheless that they kind of have to fight themselves. So, and last night, uh, you know, we talked about Paddock a little bit. Uh, you know, he didn't have his change up working. Uh, you know, th that's really, you know, he's like you said, with the 
miles per hour notes, you know, he's not going to throw in the upper nineties consistently. Right. He might get to the middle and that's about it. But if he, he doesn't have his changeup working and it's really not working, he's going to struggle. So, and he gave up whatever it was, 13 hits or a season, a career high. So, uh, you know, that's, that is going to happen. Yeah. It, it just kind of is what it is. Uh, mostly good to this point though, in the last few starts. So he's been doing his job really well. You know, it's, it's uh, tough because we, you know, you asked me the other day about, well, what can we expect from uh, SWR, Simeon Woods Richardson? And I said, you know, inconsistency. I think he's he's going to have some good starts and he's going to have some some clunkers. And to a degree, that's kind of what they're going to get out of, of Paddock, too. Uh, maybe a little more consistency, maybe a little better when he's on, but still it's not going to be roses every time. Right. And I mean, if it was, he'd be the ace of the staff and yeah. not the number four or whatever you want to call him. I, I want to ask you, what did you think about Carlos Rodon going back out for the seventh? He had 90, not 90 but, um, it was, uh, it looked like they were going batter to batter. And there's a couple things in play here. First of all, he had thrown nearly 100 pitches. He does not have a sparkling history of injury, uh, injury yeah. prevention. Uh, you only let him face one batter and the bullpen had four guys pitch the night before. I think three of them threw 20 plus pitches and then another through like 16. And in fact, um, last night was, I think three straight for Hamilton, which I don't know that you would ever see from a twins reliever, but I just, I thought it was a little, nervous. yeah, I thought it was a little strange that he went back out there, had a one batter, uh, like at a one drink minimum, if it was a comedy club. Um, Carlos Santana gets the hit. They lift him. I don't know. It just, to me, seems strange that he went back out there for that when they do have a fairly rested bullpen, uh, you know, not perfect, but not bad either. Uh, it does seem to me that it, it seemed kind of like a, a move maybe that Rocco would make with, I mean, he's getting good results out of, uh, Rodon and you know, Rodon is, you know, the kind of guy that's like, yeah, give me the ball. You know, he's probably to the nth degree there, uh, a bulldog when it comes to, you know, taking him out of the game. He doesn't want it. Um, but I, I'm sure uh, Aaron Boone was, um, you know, cutting a corner there with yep. getting an extra out or two, whatever he could muster out of uh, his pitcher, sort of like Rocco has done on occasion, uh, you know, get, getting Bailey over later into games and so forth. And and uh, and Lopez has, has done a, a couple of, you know, there have been a couple instances where I've figured that Rocco would prefer maybe to get the starter out of there sooner rather than later, but because of how a pitching staff works, he, he wasn't really comfortable with doing that. So I think it was one of those cases where he was just trying to get as much blood from the turnip as he could. So uh, you said th three straight games for Hamilton. So uh, I think that I'll, I'll pull it up just to be safe because I know it was three straight for one of the guys. And I think, did they play Monday? They, did they have a day off? They did, they did play Monday. They did. Uh, so it was three straight for oh oh no it was three of four for Hamilton they did not play Monday my mistake that's it had Monday as an open day and I'm used to that being the most recent game so I got confused it's three of the last four for Hamilton so well I mean that's still more than is uh, typical know. for at least when comparing it to the Twins I think that's that's the thing that we're uh, we can identify with the most Rocco's usage versus um, the other teams. So that's not something you see too often with him. And that that's really kind of pushing it. So I, I see where my mistake was the, the, the windows are different for starters and relievers on roster resource. Oh. And it's uh probable starters for the next six days and relievers for the last six days. And so I, I got my, got my wires crossed, which well, you need uh, to memorize all this stuff because it's, it's important data. So, so the Twins have had some matchups here in the last, I don't know, week, 10 days where it's like, okay, it's a good starter, but get to the bullpen and you'll be okay, you know, or, or you have a better chance. And we've yeah. seen, as they said on the broadcast last night, Twins 780 OPS in inning seven through nine tops in MLB. The Yankees are not quite that. They are second in MLB in bullpen ERA. They're one of three teams giving up a sub 600 OPS from relievers. And what's hilarious is... Not only is there ample Twins flavor in terms of Michael Tonkin, Ian Hamilton, Dennis Santana, Nick Birdie, but do you know who their top setup man is outside of Ian Hamilton? I I, I asked Lou Hennessy on the postcast last night, and he had no idea. 
Hmm. Um, what does top setup man mean? What do you mean? What is how how is that determined? No, I just like who do they go to late? They go to who do they go to late ahead of Clay Holmes and uh, not in addition to Hamilton? Who else? Like Ross yeah. Research has this guy listed as their setup well, man. My it, my fantasy team thought it was Hamilton, and when I had Hamilton on my team, he he didn't pitch. I don't know if he was nursing anything. So um, I don't know. It's not Jonathan Lasagna. We know that. Uh, in a hint, he's up for auction in my auto new league that you and I share. Um, I don't remember. The Dream Weaver himself, Luke Weaver. Oh, that's right. So their entire bullpen yeah. is Clay Holmes as well. Not to be uh, dismissive, their whole bullpen is Clay Holmes. No, um, beyond him, working from uh, highest leverage to lowest based on how roster resource has them, Luke Weaver, Ian Hamilton, Caleb Ferguson, Nick Birdie, Victor Gonzalez, who hasn't pitched in a week, um, is their second lefty, uh, Dennis Santana, and Michael Tonkin. That is like uh, the ultimate massage massaging of personnel that you could imagine by Aaron Boone because – this is, again, the second-best bullpen in MLB by ERA behind the Guardians with virtually nobody anybody knows outside of Clay Holmes. I would say I would add to that for now it is. Yeah. Um, although, I mean, no one has ever said that Luke Weaver didn't have good stuff. It seems to I, me like that's been kind of an overdue move on his part. Maybe he hasn't wanted to. Uh, you know, you look at like a guy like Seth Lugo, who is really a great – set up, man. He's like, no, I want to be a starter and make some money and have some consistency in my life. And I wonder if it's kind of where, where Weaver's been. However, it seems like Weaver um, is better suited for this role. Now, you know, how long that's able to last, who knows, but uh, that is the, uh, the mercurial nature of the, of the bullpen. And I would not be like overly confident about that group if I was a Yankees fan. So um, a, lot of, a lot of befores in that group. Yeah, but you know they can't all be. You know they, they you kind of you're going to have a lead at some point. So, um, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, Rodon having getting back to him, just thinking about how he wasn't throwing that hard, and he used to. You know, he did in the past, and I wonder if he has got like made that adjustment now to being more of a a middling guy because he was he could get it up there before with the White Sox and with well, the Giants. Yeah. If you're a sinker kind of guy, sometimes it's, oh, it's too strong. It's too, you're throwing it too hard. Mm -hmm. um, the four guys that they have out of their bullpen on the IL, though, it's a pretty good list. Uh, Lou Trevino is on the 60, had Tommy John. Yeah. John Lasagna, uh, the Gar Garfield's favorite, had uh, elbow surgery in April. Tommy Canely. And then uh, one of my favorite little bits was this guy pitched for Dave Ross and his last name is F Ross. Uh, Scott F Ross had back surgery in December. So yeah, uh, they have some talent there on the IL, but it's uh, none of it appears all that close to returning. Poor um, Tommy Canley. He'd, he'd make a good twin. He's always kind of on the verge of getting over being hurt or just on his way to the next injury. It's I, I don't think Latroy Hawkins would let that happen. Do you remember that? Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. So uh, if comments. people don't know that, uh, use the Google. Once you're looking up a pitcher injury, go ahead and Google LaTroy Hawkins and Tommy Canely besides. But quick word from Price Picks. We'll come back. I have an interesting Glenn Perkins thought, and we're going to go around the affiliates and around the division really, really quickly. But again, first a word from Price Picks. Prize Picks is North America's number one daily fantasy sports platform, and it's easy and exciting because it's just you against the numbers. So you're not playing against a bunch of other players in a huge contest where you have almost no chance of winning unless you enter a million entries. You just pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch your winnings come to roost. And it's got an app. The app has a feature called Demons and Goblins. So if you are more risk averse, you want to take those chances and win big money. You can play the demon picks marked in red and you can win like with multipliers of up to a hundred times what you put down. So 10 bucks down, thousand bucks in again, risky, but if you think you know ball, that's the way to go. And if you're more cautious, you can use a goblin pick. Those are marked in green. They're a little easier to uh, kind of deduce how you can get your wins and stack them up and that sort of thing, but it'll keep you in the green and the payouts less, but your chances of keeping your streak going are much, much higher. So if you're into the NBA, we are well into the second round of the playoffs. You can pick more than or less than on everything from trays to turnovers. And for MLB, any stat under the sun you can imagine. Baseball has probably more stats than any other sport. 
Go in and check it out. Really, the only way you can is to download the app and enter code locked on MLB, all one word, all lowercase, and they'll de- they'll match your first deposit up to 100 bucks. Again, locked on MLB, all one word, all lowercase, and get a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. So you can join prize picks today. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, Dave, the co- like, you know what? We'll go around the affiliates first. St. Paul is against Omaha or going up against Omaha. Um, it's Luis Sessa going for Omaha. Twins had, or Saints rather, had not announced a starter as of about an hour ago. Uh, they've won three of the last four, beat Omaha 13-7 to on Tuesday. Uh, Balazovic getting the win. Wichita's playing right now. They're 14-19. It's Zebby Matthews against Dalton Rushing, who is one of the uh, better prospects on the Dodger side of things pitching wise and there was a delay but that one is going as we speak on MLB.tv so highly recommend checking that out Cedar Rapids has uh, quad cities today Uh, it's Andrew Morris going for them and then Fort Myers at Lakeland they have probably my favorite name pitching today in the entire organization uh, Paul Sean Pasqualato (laughs) just an incredible name um Around the division, uh, Guardians beat the Rangers 7-4. They've won three in a row. Six runs second takes them past the Rangers with a couple of Naylor extra base hits, one from Bo, a double, one from Josh, a homer. And they crushed Jack Leiter, which has not been that shocking so far this year. Uh, Ben Lively was okay, three home runs in five innings, but all solo homers, which will work. Royals are a game and a half back. They beat Seattle in Seattle 4-2, and Nelson Velasquez homer laid off. Logan Gilbert gave them the lead. Uh, twins, as you know, two games back 24 and 17, they've got two more with the Yankees and then they're in Cleveland for what should promise to be a really good series. Tigers are dead. Even at 21, 21, five and a half back. They lost a heartbreaker one zero to the Marlins in 10 innings. Marlins are 20 games under 500, which is hard to believe at this point, but uh tough, tough day against starters, Ryan Weathers and Reese Olson, who both threw eight shutout innings, but Alex Lang gives up a ground ball to second. And the Manfred man comes home to score. And that's the only run of the entire day. Uh, White Sox split a doubleheader with the Nationals. 6-3 loss. Chris Flexen and John Brebbia get knocked around. And then in the nightcap, a 4-0 win. Eric Fetty beats his old friends, the Nationals, with seven shutout innings, six strikeouts. And Andrew Vaughn hit a couple homers. So we'll see if he is maybe starting to wake up the stick a little bit. Uh, any thoughts on those? I think as soon as Andrew Vaughn... Uh... Wakes up the stick a little bit. They should trade him because even in the previous couple of years, he hasn't slugged any higher than I think 420 something. And that's just not going to get it done at first base. So, uh, and Eric Fetty, uh, let's maybe see if we can get him to start the all star game. He, he might be, I don't think that's going to happen, but it could. And that would be pretty amazing if it did. Well, and then they'll have their ready made uh, representative. And you won't have to debate if. Gavin Sheets is really playing well enough to to play in an All Star game, which is, you know, we got a lot of time before that happens, but uh, we'll see how that comes. Did you see him miss the fly ball yesterday? Yeah, I did. And yeah. again, like maybe Andrew Vaughn should go back to right field. You know, like you're just, not funny. That's not nice. Don't well, do I've that. never been funny. Like, there's no denying that. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's something, man. Um, Glenn Perkins had an interesting comment. He said. Second base is stolen off the catcher. Third base is stolen off the pitcher. And, I mean, I never really thought of it that way, but I suspect it has to do with, like, the pitcher really has to control the runner at second and keep them close because they can take a bigger lead and and that sort of thing. And it's a shorter throw for the catcher. So the catcher, while he has the control of it, uh, the pitcher has to keep the runner close. At first base, you know, the ground, a lot of ground gets made up by the throw as opposed to, maybe the pitcher holding that runner on, but I don't know. I mean, when you hear that statement, what, what do you think? I think uh, Glenn Perkins is a biased lefty who has a built-in uh, defense against holding runners at first base. So he, he didn't even have to do it well. He could just be, he could just be man. And he's facing the runner. Merely so existing. It's uh, I don't know, man. I think, uh, I think second base is stolen on the pitcher too. Mostly uh, I've seen too many, you know, I remember even when the White Sox were good, you know, well, that, that happened once and uh, they were terrible at holding runners and they, cause they just didn't give a, a hoot. This is uh this is the Don Cooper. This is the 2005 guys, all yeah. those guys who completed games in the playoffs and they won the world series. They could not give a crap about holding runners. And then, you know, in those days, 
people were running still a little bit. They hadn't stopped completely. So it was still a thing. And um, it's because the pitchers were concentrating on pitching. And I think I do like the changes that baseball has made in the last couple of years to make it easier to steal bases, to make the game, uh, give an X factor, give the pitchers something else to worry about. But I think it's, it's still mostly on them that uh-huh. uh, second base is stolen. Sorry, Glenn. One thing I liked with Paul Molitor's style talking, you learn something from him every time on the radio broadcast. And we'll, we'll close with this. But he said, um, oh, who was playing first base last night? It would have been Rizzo. Um, Rizzo was in on the the grass on a play that seemed a little bit like, oh, what's he doing there? And mm-hmm. while it was to take away the bunt, Molitor said, maybe – Carlos Rodon doesn't cover the first baseline very well. And so they have to kind of make up for that with, I think it was Willie Castro batting. Who's, you know, one of the faster guys on the twins. Yeah. I thought that was interesting because, you know, you think about it, a left-handed pitcher is going to fall off to the third base side. Right. So he's going to have trouble covering that line. Once you get over to that line, you still have to pivot your body and throw. Uh, so having Rizzo kind of cheat in a little bit is going to kind of get rid of some of those deficiencies. I don't know. Just to me, the game within the game kind of things that a manager or a player or just a lifer sees that the average fan wouldn't even understand. Yeah. I, I love getting that from the radio broadcast. And he's got uh, molitor has got a really smooth uh, delivery over there and okay. is comfortable on the radio. I had a chance to listen yesterday and I really liked his enthusiasm and his elocution and his uh, information. So, I mean, he was, uh, he, he was great. Uh, and I think Dan Gladden does a good job too, but I really liked hearing from Molitor. Yeah, so I agree. But- with Mahler, it's like talking to a manager, but with the shackles removed because he doesn't have to, you know, say this guy in the bullpen is not yeah, available. He can be less political. Yeah. Well, hey, that's a wrap. That's all we got for you. We'll be back to break down game two with the postcast and then probably again a little later with Dave Brown here. But thanks for hanging out with us on Locked On Twins. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Goodbye.